Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Last week, we started a brand new series called Ghosted. We introduced the idea of what being ghosted is. You're friends with somebody, everything's going great, and then one day they just stop texting, returning your calls, whatever, you got ghosted. And Jesus said, I'm going to ghost you. I have to go away to be with the Father, but I'm not going to ghost you the way the world ghosts you. I'm going to holy ghost you with power from on high, and we are studying what that looks like. Who is the Holy Spirit? What is his work today? Last week... We talked about the Holy Ghost, who we, uh, how he came to earth and what his mission is. And I, I want to start by just kind of explaining a little bit about my background. Um, honestly, I don't know when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. My mom and dad said it was when I was like four years old, but I don't have any memory of that. Um, so around 12, I did it again just to make sure because I was really scared of going to hell. <laughs> and so like we wrote a date in my Bible But really this whole uh, Holy Ghost thing, speaking in tongues, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's always been part of my life. So I don't know when that happened. I don't remember an occurrence. I've just always have had a relationship with the Holy Spirit in my life. And I'll tell you this, I participate in that every single day. I pray in the power of the Holy Spirit every single day because if I didn't, I wouldn't be where I am today. One, I wouldn't be who I am. Two, I probably wouldn't be alive to be who I am. And three, I probably wouldn't want to be where I am doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for praying in the power of the Holy Spirit in my everyday life. I've been raised in a spirit-filled style church, and I know this might be foreign to some people who are maybe watching online or new to our church. You see that we are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, and Maybe two of those words don't make sense to you, spirit-filled and life-giving. Um, you say, what is a life-giving church? And it's really, it's not a denomination, but have you ever been to a life-sucking church? <laughs> it's the opposite of that. All right, it's the opposite of that. Services are a little shorter, they're a little lighter, they're a little funner, we we'll laugh a little bit, we might cry a little bit, but you're going to leave here with a good spiritual meal, and you're going to feel good about God in your life today, Amen. So the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call him, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Ghost, whatever you want to call him, Spirit, you can call him those things. It's interchangeable throughout the scriptures. If you're reading the King James Version, it's going to say Holy Ghost. A lot of times you're reading the NIV or the NLT or the American Standard Version, it may refer to him as the Holy Spirit. Both interchangeable. Uh, But this has been a part of my life throughout 30, well, I can't even tell you, I'm 42 years old, so... 37 years of life in church world. My dad started in 1982. Um, Being spirit-filled has been part of that. And here's one of the verses that we use. It's in the book of Jude. Jude is the book right before Revelation. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Jude is right before that. And in Jude 1, 20, it says this. But ye, you know we're, we're reading some King James right now, right? It's King James. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So uh, being raised in a spirit-filled church, this verse meant to us that I was supposed to pray in tongues, pray in the heavenly language every single day, and that's how you built yourself up. That was my teaching. That was my raising. And and I believed it, and I do believe it. I, I do this to build myself up. But I do believe that there's other translations of the Bible that looked at the whole word for word and passage and wrote it a little bit differently that brings some liberty and freedom to those who have not experienced the gifts of the Spirit yet. And in the New Living Translation, it says this, Jude one twenty. but you, dear friends, we realize this is not King James, but you, dear friends, must build each other up and yourself up in your most holy faith, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. So you can pray in the power of the Holy Spirit without it being a form of speaking in other tongues. We're going to talk about that kind of stuff later on in our series, 
But today, I want to talk to you about the person, the Holy Ghost. The person who is the Holy Ghost. Last week we said that the Holy Ghost is the third person in the Trinity. We learned that the word Trinity is not in the Bible. It's not a biblical term. It's a, it, it's a term that we use to describe the Godhead. Trinity is a compound word, tri-unity, three in one. Three in one by unity alone. But we believe the Godhead Elohim, Elohim is the plurality of God, God three in one, is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God who operates in three persons, they are one in unity, they are one in thought, they are one in purpose, they are one in decision and direction, but they operate as three individual persons. And I want you to get this today, in this church we believe the Holy Ghost is a person, not a force or an influence. The Holy Ghost is a person, not a force or an influence. You can put that right up on the screen so they realize that that's the big tip of the day. The Holy Ghost is a person, not a force or an influence. And as I was preparing for the series, I asked some of my staff, I was like, hey, are you spirit-filled? And this one person was like, yeah, I'm spirit-filled. I was like, well, how do you know? And I'm, I love these kinds of conversations because I'm an Enneagram 8. And Enneagram 8 is a challenger. A challenger is someone who doesn't just believe something because it's the way it's always been or because someone said it. I said, how do you know that you're spirit-filled? And they said, well, because, like, I was praying and all of a sudden I got goosebumps. I said, wait. Wait. That is the worst explanation in the entire world for you knowing something about yourself. You're going to tell me that you know that you have the spirit of God because you got goosebumps. You sure you just didn't have to pee? <laughs> Are you sure the air conditioning just didn't kick on and get you down the back of your, 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 your shirt? Like, to say it was a feeling is the least qualified answer to say that you are spirit-filled, okay? I just want you to get to know that. Understand this. But I want to talk to you. He's a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. In John 16, 12, and as I read this, it's going to be kind of annoying how I read it, but it, you're going to get my point. Ready? I still have many, Jesus is speaking, I still have many things I want to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Although that the Father, all the things that are the Father's are mine, therefore I say that he will take care of mine and declare it to you. Nine times in this one passage, the Holy Ghost is declared to us as he. He. A person. We accept and believe here at Family Church and we worship a person, the person, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to step into something here, but I'm going to step very gingerly and very lightly. Is that okay? This is not a political statement. This is not a sexist statement. This is not to throw shade or attack any agendas in society today. I just want to tell you this. The Holy Ghost is not confused by his gender. Okay? He's not confused by his gender. We know straight out the Holy Ghost is a he. Okay? John 14, 17. That's as far as I'm prepared to go with that statement. John 14, 17 says this. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Hey, man, if you need to know some truth in your life, if there's some lies happening around you or in your life and you need to know some truth, you need to get some Holy Ghost on, yeah. to lead you into the truth. The world cannot receive him. One, because the world ain't looking for him. I want the church to understand this today, that we are in a post Christian 
generation. Okay? Post-Christian. Post-church. Which means the generation being raised today has not even heard of God or heard of church. They have no religious background that has tainted them to feel some way about God, but they have no faith to believe in God because they haven't even heard yet. Look at this. They can't know him because they haven't even heard of him. Because honestly, and can we be frank? The world's not looking for church. The world's not looking for God. The world's looking for peace. It's looking for acceptance. It's looking for love. It's looking for joy, a good time. All these things are found in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they're not looking for that. They're not looking for that. We have people tell us they'll come rent the building for like dance productions and concerts and different things. And people will say to us, I didn't even know that you were here. And so my staff, they kind of get a little upset like, man, you know, we got to do more because they didn't know we were here. I said, wait, wait, wait. Were they looking for a church? Because if you Google us, we're number one. So you weren't looking. So how are you going to find something you're not looking for? They said they're not going to know the Holy Ghost because it isn't looking for him. And even if they found him, they wouldn't recognize him. Because they don't really know what they're looking for. But you know him. Now he's talking to the church. But you know him. Believers, you know him. Because he lives with you. Jesus is speaking. He hasn't been crucified. He hasn't died. Pe Day of Pentecost hasn't come. Watch. He's with you now and will be in you later. Pro prophetic about how the Holy Spirit was going to come and be in our lives. So, I want you to understand. All of these he, him, his. The Holy Spirit is a person, not an impersonal force or influence. He is not chill bumps down your back during a church service. The Spirit of God has personal qualities and personal functions. The Spirit of God presents himself in the world to work out the purpose of the Father on the earth today. Philippians 2.13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. God is working through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Heavenly Father is working through the power of the Holy Spirit within you to accomplish his will on the earth today. And I just want to ask you, will you let him? Will you let him? I think a lot of times we just get in the Holy Spirit's way. We get in his way from doing the will of God. So in John chapters 14 through 16, Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost as a personal friend, as someone who's with you there all the time, and he uses a Greek word, ekenos, ekenos. I worked really hard to try to say it, and then this like Greek theologian first service corrected me because I even said it wrong after I had studied it for like days, ekenos. Now the word, this Greek word, standing alone, the Greek is like the hardest language in the entire world to understand. The new Greek is easier than the old Greek, but this is an old Greek word, and it's like impossible to understand. They have seven tenses for every word, and every word can mean three to five things. Okay, so this word, ekenos, it can mean he, she, or it. It can mean he, she, or it. Okay, so there you go. Holy Spirit's confused. Doesn't know what he is. He, she, or it. No, no, no. In the, in the passage, in the way that it was written in the Greek, it is written in the masculine personal pronoun. Man, I don't even know if we have that in English. But this word, ekenos, was written in the masculine personal pronoun, meaning we're talking about he. He. The spirit of truth. When he, the Holy Ghost, he is a person, he is not a force, and he is not confused. And this is very important for us to know. Because I'm telling you right now, you can decide straight out whether family church is a home for you or not based upon that theology alone. Because that theology alone splits many churches. Many churches believe that the Trinity or the Godhead is one God with three personalities. 
and one of his personalities is the Holy Ghost, and I'm a psychology major, and that just means that you're a split personality disorder. <laughs> Come on, somebody. One God in three persons operating in unity. Very important. It's a core belief of this church that we believe in one God who operates as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One perfect in unity. Thought in purpose, will in action. I'll just give you a little bit of an example, okay? Um, let's just look at my mom, my dad, and me. We're all McKelvey. But I'm Michael, Joe, and Lynn. We're McKelvey. But Michael, Joe, and Lynn, and when we really are on a task, we're working together. I've got my task, my dad has his task, mom has her task, and we're working in unity. McKelvey, but three people. God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But he is a he, he is a person, he's a spirit. But I want to identify today when we're talking about person, we're not talking about human. So when you get saved, you don't get impregnated with a human, baby, Holy Ghost. But you do receive the Holy Ghost to live within you. A, by person, we mean one who has their own identity or individuality as a rational being. They are conscious of their own existence. This, these are the marks of a genuine person that they have knowledge, feelings, and a will. The Holy Ghost is a person. He has a personality. He's an individual. He has rational thought. He's conscious of his own existence. So I want to look at some key factors today about the Holy Ghost. And today's message is this. The Holy Ghost is a person. So meet the man, the Holy Ghost. Meet the man, the Holy Ghost. Ready? First thing I want you to know is this, that the Holy Spirit has a mind the Holy Spirit has a mind. Scripture says that the Holy Spirit has a mind. When Paul, the apostle, wrote in the book of Romans, he says this in Romans 8, 27. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The mind of the Spirit. He has a mind. Having a mind means that they have thought and that they have purpose. And these are attributes of a personality. To have a personality, you must be a person. Personality. Are we following me? Here's another thing we need to understand about the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is an emotional being. Emotional being. So if you've ever been in a church service that had some emotion, and now I like emotion, but I don't like emotionalism. I think emotionalism goes a little far. I was raised in some emotionalism where like the Holy Ghost showed up and people just lost their dang minds. I believe in a Holy Spirit that is decent and in order, that has structure and systems in place. But I do understand that when your body, your mind, your will, your spirit, your emotions come in contact with the power of God, you can act some sort of crazy. I do get that. I do get that. But when it starts causing bodily harm, people start running around the room, smacking into the wall and busting their face, then we got to talk. We got to talk whether that was the Holy Ghost or your emotions. Come on, somebody. Uh, yeah, listen, I'm playing umpire, all right? I'm playing both sides of the field on this one. Because, yo, I can get crazy. I'll call some fire down from heaven like Elijah, you want me to. But on the other side... A lot of stuff that has happened in church is embarrassing to me. I want true, authentic moves of the Holy Spirit. I want people who walk in with hurts, habits, hang up, bondages, yokes to be destroyed at the power of the Holy Spirit. I want when we worship, when we worship, that there's a presence of God in here, a tangible force that we could feel His presence. That's the, I could give my life to that. But He's an emotional being. First thing is this, he can give and receive love. The Holy Spirit can give and receive love. In Romans 15, 30, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the love of the Spirit, 
by the love of the Spirit to join me in earnest prayer on God's behalf. It is possible for you to not like someone but still demonstrate the love of the Holy Spirit to them. <laughs> it ain't easy. It ain't easy. But I can allow the Holy Spirit to do his perfect work through an imperfect person if I get out of his way and allow the person, the Holy Spirit, to do his job. The love of Christ can be shown through the Holy Spirit. Here's another one. The Holy Spirit's an emotional being. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Grieved. Now, there were some well-intentioned people in my past. We'll call them some elders of the faith, OG Christians, who as I was a kid, I liked to play around with church stuff. Now, let me just, let's be honest in this room. Anybody in here as a kid, you ever gone into a swimming pool with other church kids and practiced baptizing each other? <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> The other day, the other day, we were in the swimming pool playing or whatever, and I, my son, he's eight. I was like, Liam, when you're ready to get baptized, I want to show you how I'm going to baptize you. And I grabbed him by his head and his face, and I picked him up, and I body slammed him. <laughs> like, that's how you're going to be baptized in front of everybody. Anyway, we practiced baptizing each other. We would practiced like we were in like a healing line, and we'd shake our hands, and we'd fall down and like catch each other. Anybody did that? Yeah, you're going to hell. <laughs> so, so people would see us like play around and stuff like that like you better knock it off you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost yeah, no we weren't I bet he was laughing just like we were laughing like it ain't that serious the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is the rejection of Jesus Christ All right, that's, 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 that's the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, the rejection of Jesus Christ. Not playing around and doing stupid stuff and someone judging you. and like, ah, ah, ah. So they were, or they, they were well-intentioned, trying to keep us on track, but they were wrong. That was not blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. But there is something that can happen in your life that you can grieve the Holy Ghost. All right, in Ephesians 4.32, Paul tells us, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. Now, who is he talking to? Believers, right? Because only believers can be sealed. So only believers can grieve the Holy Ghost. An unbeliever cannot grieve the Holy Ghost. Only believers can. Believers cannot blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Only unbelievers can. Get, are we getting this? All right. Because to be a believer means that I'm not going to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. Watch this. You were sealed to the day of redemption. So right there... Even grieving the Holy Ghost does not mean you lose your salvation. I'm sealed. I got a Ziploc baggie. <laughs> sealed. All right. But he says this. But this is how we grieve the Holy Ghost. By being bitter. By being, showing wrath. By showing anger. Clamor. By evil speaking. Now, can we talk about this for one second? Because we have a pandemic in the church called gossip. And when I say church, I don't mean family church alone. I'm talking about church international. Listen, let me define gossip. Can we define gossip? Here's gossip. Talking about someone behind their back with no intention of helping them. If I'm discussing their situation because I'm going to take $1,000 and go bail them out, then I can talk about it. But me just sitting there talking about you, not trying to help you. You know what the Bible says? Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. That's what it says. Shut your mouth. Because when you don't, you're grieving the Holy Ghost. I'll, oh, man, I'm going to step. I'm going to. A lot of what the church world calls prayer chains 
grieves the Holy Ghost. Because half a church's prayer chains are gossip chains with a sprinkle of spirit at the end. Oh, did you hear about so-and-so, what's, what's going on in their life? Dude, come, like, who cares? What are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? How are we going to help somebody? How are we going to change their life? How are we going to change the world? Oh, you don't care? Click. Get rid of malice. Get away. But do you want to do the opposite of grieve the Holy Ghost? Do you want to fill the Spirit with life? Look what it says. Then be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. Come on, man, get rid of that unforgiveness in your heart. Even as Christ forgave you. The fact that the Holy Spirit could get grieved shows personality. You cannot grieve an influence or an impersonal force. The Holy Ghost is a person. He has the ability to choose. I bet you've not read this verse this way before. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one and the same Spirit works all things distributing to each other, uh, to each, yeah, each one individually as He wills. So the Holy Spirit gets to choose who gets what gift. It's as He wills. This is a big, 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 another big dilemma and problem in the church today. But you know, I just... You know, maybe I just don't have the spirit because it's just not his will. Because it's just not his will. Do you know what his will is? His will is good and pleasing. His will is that all have all. He distributes all, all. But we don't want it. You don't really want it. We don't really want it. Because if we wanted it, there's another verse that says desire the gifts. This verse says practice the gifts. We don't really want it. As I just one person, they wrote me, said, pa- Pastor, I can't come to your church no more because I'm not being fed spiritually. <laughs> I'm not being fed spiritually. Big theologian. I'm being really nasty right now. I'm going to ask God to forgive me when I'm done preaching. I said, okay, can I ask you a question, sir? Yes. How many of the three verses I gave you on Sunday did you go look up and study? Amen. Amen. <laughs> so I provided a meal that you didn't eat, but it's my fault that you're starving. Okay. Okay. See, the Holy Spirit's sitting here with a platter of, here's my will. Here's my will. Here's the gifts. Here it is. Take eat. This is the gift for you. I really wish the Holy Spirit would strengthen me. It's right here. Take it. Yeah, Yeah, but just pour out the Spirit. Pour out the Spirit. But, But he's here. Listen, we ain't waiting for the Spirit to show up. We ain't waiting for him to pour out. We ain't singing, fall, Holy Spirit, fall. He's already here. I, I'm already being facetious. There's a song out there, come Lord Jesus, come. All right, do you realize if the Lord Jesus comes, you're dead? <laughs> Dumb song. He came, he brought his spirit, he left the spirit of truth with us to be with us. There will be a day. That Christ will return for his church and there will be a trumpet sound and the heavens will open and the dead in Christ shall rise and those who remain will be caught together and meet them in the clouds. But we don't really want that yet. And we don't really want the gifts yet. We want them when we need them. But we don't really want them when he wills. I know, I'm sorry. 
But this is, this, this is the issue with the church. We make it his fault. Well, I guess I don't have the gifts because it's not as well. And he's like, I've offered them to you like 27 million times, but how about you look up a Bible verse? Just one, like one out of the 20 I've already given you. Just one. Go look it up. Listen, I'm telling you straight away right now, don't believe a single word I just said about any. I made all this up. In fact, there's not even a book in the Bible called John. I made that all up. It's actually pronounced Juan. I'm still being facetious. I want you to know him the Holy Ghost, for yourself, him, the Holy Ghost. If he's a person, then you need a relationship. I gave you so much, I'm just going to leave my notes for a little bit. So this week, I don't, I don't really post a lot about what I do during the week or where I am, but this week I was away. I was in Montana. I went fly fishing with 16 pastors from around the country. I knew two of them. I didn't know the rest of them. And so for five days, we would either be out fishing or be back at the house around a, a fire pit or a table eating, getting to know each other. I've seen so many pictures of people's kids this week. I don't need to see any more pictures of people's kids. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> heard, stories about, yeah, heard stories about marriages and mistakes and struggles and wins. You see, there's no shortcut to getting to know a person. There is a currency that's very expensive, it's called time. And only time invested into a relationship grows the knowledge of that person. That's the Holy Spirit to us. That's the Holy Ghost to us. He is there. He, the Holy Spirit's a comforter. The Holy Spirit is a guide. I should have saved this little, this little tidbit for a different sermon, but I'm in a fishing boat where we're trout fishing. We're fly fishing, but we're standing up in a fly fishing boat where you got your legs locked in to this thing, and there's a guy fly fishing in the front. You have a guide in the middle of the boat, and then I was in the back of the boat fly fishing either side that he says, and the guide would say, yo, Mike, see where those two, those two types of water are moving like weird? I want you to throw your line right there. Th throw the line right there. And I would, you know, with my fly fishing, I'd cast it. I'd go, no, 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 you got to go a little further out. Yeah, yeah, right there, right there. And man, if I dropped my line right where my guide told me to put my line, there was provision there. There was, there was the goal that we were looking for, what we were searching for was where my guide told me to cast that line. See, my guide, he knew the river. My guide, he knew more than me about trout fishing. So my guide could help me. He could put me where I needed to be. And then, and then when I caught that fish that he put me on that I didn't know was there or how to get it, but he did, and I just did what he said, we celebrated. We celebrated together. It's the Holy Ghost in your life. He's not making you feel bad. Like, even when I was trying to cast that line out there and I got tangled up on my rod and I couldn't make it to the mark that he said, he'd be like, no, Mike, it's cool. Pulled the boat over, dropped the anchor. He untangled me. Man, some of us just... Some of us in our lives, we've just been so tangled up in our mess, man. That guy never once yelled at me for being tangled up. You know, the Holy Spirit, he never once, he never once screamed hurtful words at you for being tangled up in your mess. He pulled that boat over. My guide untangled it. Sometimes there was no fixing it. Sometimes I just messed up, I just jacked up that rod so bad. There's sometimes he just cut the line. He said, we're going to start fresh. We're going to start with a fresh line, fresh indicator, the kind of bait we're using called nymphs. We were nymphing for, for these fish. I said, man, Mike, all good. Want a soda? Want a water? Sit down. Relax while I do the work. Mm, yeah. 
This is what I'm here for. I'm your guide. Would we let the Holy Spirit do his job in our life? Would we let the Holy Spirit do his job in our life? And the first step in allowing the Holy Spirit to do his job is that we got to meet him. we got to meet him. There's got to be an introduction. Because he's here right now with us, but Jesus said he would live inside of us. He would live within us. He, he'd be that, that indicator within us. And we got to meet him. There's got to be an introduction. There's got to be this acceptance of, I need you in my life, Holy Spirit. I need a change because I'm dealing with bitterness. I'm dealing with anger. I'm dealing with hurts from my past. I'm dealing with being able to move on. I'm so tangled. I'm so tangled up in what I thought life was and what it was going to be. And things just aren't working out the way they're supposed to be. I need a helper. I need a comforter. I need a healer. I need a guide. I want to introduce you to my best friend, the Holy Ghost. I've talked to him all day long. It's the only thing that keeps my mind straight. I don't pray very long. I don't. I heard this, this guy at one of the lunch tables was saying, yeah, man, most pastors don't pray more than 50 minutes a day. I was like, whoa, hey, 50 minutes, that's a lot. <laughs> I'm like, at one time? Or like within 24 hours, like what? He goes, no, I didn't say 50 minutes, I said 15. I said, oh, no, no, we're good, we're good. We can do 15 minutes. It's like 50 minutes, dag. So I don't, like seriously, like I don't pray long at one time. Like ADD kicks in, I'm done. <laughs> but I don't go very long without talking to God. I want him in my thoughts. I want him in my decisions. I want him in my meetings. When I walk outside and I see the sky looking like crazy beautiful out, I just take a second and I'm like, God. Yes. Floating down this river, floating down this river my last day, and one of the guides, he's like, yeah, yeah, look, 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 look. This black bear had come off the Montana mountain, and he walked right down to the shoreline, and he scooped his hand in the water and grabbed a fish and laid down, sprawled out on the bank of this shore, just eating on this fish. Now, I know that sounds nasty for all the humanitarians and animal lovers, but I'm like, dude, that was awesome. And I was like, this is, like, where do you see nature like this? Like, I haven't been out in nature like this. And I had this moment with God where my guide wasn't talking. The other guy in the boat wasn't saying anything. I'm in the middle of this open country, this wilderness of dry plains and flourished mountains. And there was God. There was the Holy Spirit. There was a peace that surpasses all understanding. There was a joy from the Lord that strengthened me. It was all there. And I wasn't necessarily looking for him, but he was looking for me. He knew what I needed this week. He knew I needed a rest. He knew I needed a break. It's my first personal alone getaway since before the pandemic started in 2019. Do you know him? Do you know the Holy Ghost in your own personal life? And to get to that place... It's called, we, we pray a prayer of salvation. A prayer of salvation means that I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and I confess that with my mouth. And when I do that prayer, the Holy Spirit comes and he abides and lives on the inside of me. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to feel 100% changed or different tomorrow. It means that the work of the Holy Spirit begins at that moment. The Holy Spirit, the work begins, and it's a slow cleansing and working. Sometimes it's faster than others. It depends how much you submit to what God wants to do in your life. But normally it's a slow process of grooming and growing in the things of God. And that prayer goes like this. If you've never prayed it before, we ask you to pray. And if you have prayed it before, let's encourage those around us by praying it out loud as well. If you're watching online, please join us. It goes like this. Dear God, Dear God I, come to you, I come to you just like I am. Like I, am. I believe that Jesus Christ 
is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you type AMEN in all capital letters? One of our online hosts would love to follow up with you and give you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you? If you prayed that for the very first time, I just want to take two seconds and celebrate you. If you prayed that for the very first time, would you just wave at me real quick so I can celebrate you? Anybody at all as I look across the room? Yeah, I see you. Anybody else real quick? Awesome. Welcome home. That same six-day devotional is available for you right outside at the Welcome Center. You can grab a copy of that. If you're here today and you're like, I don't really know about church or God or any of this, but your beard is pretty cool. <laughs> we have a booklet out at the Welcome Center called Welcome Home. It talks about what we believe here at Family Church. Free of charge to you. Just grab a copy of that. At the end of the book is the exact same prayer. Here's what I know. The agnostic, the atheist, the de-churched, the previously churched, the unchurched, need an encounter with a true God, a true God, in a life-giving way. If the church can do that, we will begin to see the church global grow at a rate that the world cannot contain. But we've got to do our job, guys. Less than 1% of churches ever invite someone to church. People that come to church ever invite someone to church. We've got to do our job to share the spirit of God that we have in our lives to those around us. That's my pitch. That's my tip. Father, I thank you for your word today. It is alive and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. I thank you that we are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Have a great weekend. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.